the reading now the book of Zechariah the book of Zechariah chapter 2 chapter 2 I lifted up mine eyes again and looked and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand then said I whither goest thou and he said unto me to measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof and behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. 
and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Chapter 3 And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Chapter 4 And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, his hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You have just listened to the Bible reading. And we need to take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Will you all rise up, please? Talk to the Lord in prayer. You've seen a commandment, a warning, an example, an instruction to obey, a promise to claim. 
pray for grace that you will do as you are blanched in the word of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. We remain standing. While the choir is coming, we also have in our midst this night the chairman of Christian Association of Nigeria, Reverend Father Joseph Opelema. Let's recognize you. You're welcome, sir. And we have in our midst His Royal Highness.
miracles, praise the Lord. I'm telling you that tonight is your night. The Lord is going to bless you because God our Father is here. God our Son is here. God our Holy Ghost is here. And your blessings is sure in Jesus' name. received it you testify sing whatever
Everybody said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for the word you have given us, revelation from heaven. We are asking, O oh Lord, that every believer, every child of God, everywhere and over here, and where we are listening to the teaching today, that we will appreciate will embrace, will value this revelation from heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that we open our hearts. We pray, children, young people, youths, boys and girls, and everyone, members of the church, singers, workers, leaders, everyone, will have the word penetrate into every heart in Jesus' name. And the grace that comes with the word, the power that comes with the word, that gives us the conviction, the consecration, the intention, the passion, and the focus to be obedient to the word in all sincerity, Grant you everyone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we are continuing with our study of the scriptures. And we're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Reading from verse 7. Galatians 5 verse 7. Ye did run well, who did hinder you, that ye should not obey the truth? That's the beginning of the passage we're looking at today. Paul the Apostle, 
because of his concern and because of his passion that the people he had preached to, Gentiles like you and I, that they will continue in the faith. And eventually, when Christ comes, they'll not be left out, they'll get to heaven. He had seen them at the commencement of the race. He had seen them at the beginning of this race, they were to run. And he looked at them and he said, you did run well. He was making use of the illustration of athletics, of the athletes that run. They begin at the beginning. They keep on track and they focus on the destination until they get to the end. And it said, you did run well. You started well. We we'll start at salvation. Except a man be born again, except a woman be born again, except a child be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so he saw that those Galatian people, like you and I, were started at the commencement of the race, salvation. And then he knew, and they knew, and we know. That if anyone is going to run well, he must stay on track. Keep on running. If you're running and you go off and you veer off the track, no matter what strength, what energy, what focus, what concentration, what sweating you put into that running, you're off track. And so you cannot get to the destination and you cannot get any reward. And so Paul the Apostle said, you started well. You were even running and you were running in the path that the Lord himself has made for us. The path of righteousness. But then you are off track. You are not running according to the rule you have changed your lane and you have moved away from the lane of the new covenant and you have veered off into the lane of the old covenant you are bringing in circumcision and i tell you that as you continue you might still be running with the same energy the same focus and the same sweating and the same skill but when you are off track and you've gone to the track of the old covenant and you are bringing in circumcision you are no more running well who now came to hinder you to not to obey the truth of the new covenant it's very important for us to know that is not just running. We must understand we're still running according to the rule. We're still running on the track. We're still maintaining our place and position in the new covenant. Obeying the truth revealed by the Lord. That, that's the summary of what the Lord is teaching us today. Divine call to run well and obey the truth the divine call that the lord has called us to repentance and to salvation and to holy living and to a life of righteousness and to keep on obeying the truth of the word of god the divine call to run well and obey the truth the three things we're looking at in the study today number one the divinely purified truth without a little leaven number two the depraved perverted teachers of lifeless legalism number three the delightful purposeful transformation into a loving life a life of love look at number one number one the divinely purified truth 
without a little leaven. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5, verses 7, 8, and 9. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Then in verse 8, it says, This persuasion, the people who came to persuade them and to make them go off track and to not go in the old covenant track rather than remaining in the new covenant track the people that came to persuade them it says this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you god called you and that persuasion those people that came to persuade you they didn't come sent by the one in heaven that called you. Verse 9, a little leaven, leaveness, the whole lamb. That little circumcision that you are bringing in will spoil the whole of your faith and the whole of your commitment that all the consecration all the commitment, the little leaven, leaveness, the whole lump, and spoils your Christian career. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the demand of total devotion to the truth. Number two, the diversion by treacherous deceivers from the truth. And number three, the danger of a little leaven in our teaching come to number one the demand of total devotion to the truth it tells us in galatians chapter 5 verse 7 look at verse 7 ye did run well who did hinder you that she should not obey the truth he wants us to be totally committed and consecrated and given and submissive to the total truth of the word of God. Ye did run well. You are running a race. And you don't finish the race until the end of life. Accepting salvation now. Possessing salvation now. Will not be enough if you don't carry that salvation. If you don't possess that salvation to the very edge of the race, sanctify, yes? But it will not benefit you if you don't possess, practice, carry on in that sanctification until the end of the race. Holy, righteous, great. But the holiness of last year will not suffice of the year you're dying you have to continue in that righteousness and holiness of life follow peace with all men and holiness without which no one no man shall see the lord it has to continue all the truth we have known all that truth should remain in our lives you did run well. Don't you understand? You must keep on running. Running well. Keep on obeying. Obeying the word of God. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. In Hebrews chapter 12. Reading from verse 1. Wherefore. Seeing. We also are compassed about. Was so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run, run, run with patience, perseverance. You might get tired, persevere, weary, persevere, and then it's like. The race is longer than you thought. Keep on running with patience. It says the race that is set before us. He set the race. We cannot modify, change, adapt, adulterate, simplify 
the, the race we need to keep on running the race that he has set before us in verse 2 we're looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith and the author has not changed the content of the faith the finisher the completer the maturer the perfecter of our faith has not changed the expectation of that faith and so we must not bring in another thing like circumcision like any of the old lives in our old depravity we keep on running the race that he has set it says for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross despising the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God then in verse 3 it says for consider him in your running running the race consider him when temptations come consider him when the tendency comes to change the race or change your track remember him consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds then in verse 4 it says ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin romans chapter 6 verse 17 but god be thanked that ye were in the past ye were before you were born again ye were the servants of sin but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you then in verse 18 being then made free from sin you became the servants of righteousness let's look at number two here number two is diversion by treacherous deceivers from the truth treacherous deceivers from the truth look at galatians 5 verse 8 this persuasion to leave the track this pressure to abandon the new covenant and this push that you will not keep on on the track of the new covenant and you bring in another idea another opinion another doctrine this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you now if the persuasion is not coming from the lord who has called us from where is it coming it's coming from treacherous deceivers from the truth and it doesn't take much deviation before you go off the track if you are running as an athlete and there are people on the sides on the seats and some of the people on the sea on the seat if they say something that catches your attention and you look away from the track while you're looking at them hearing them concentrating on what they're saying or doing you might go off the track and then you miss your way and you're not able to run to the very end as you're running the race this race set by the lord set by the savior you find those who dramatize those who act those who do this or that if you take your eyes of christ and you concentrate 
on the drama people, on those people that want to get your attention away from Christ. And you get into debate with them, argument with them, religious discussion with them. You get off track. And then you are not running the race anymore. It's like your life now is on debating. Your life is on discussion. Your life is on argument. Again with this, again with that. Leave all those things. All the dramatists, leave them alone. And all the people that like to distract you from the path of holiness and the path of righteousness, abandon all that cause and focus your mind and focus your heart and focus your prayer and focus your intention and consecration on the race that is set before us. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Another gospel. Once you add circumcision, add tradition, add opinions of men, add the character out of depravity, it becomes another gospel. Paul the apostle said, I marvel that you started well with salvation and with clean, clear conscience, but now you are diverted into another thing, which is not another, then in verse 7, in verse 7, which is not another. But there will be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Will pervert the gospel of Christ. How do they do that? Oh, they come to tell you. You believe in the Lord. They believe in the Lord too over there. And those people, they practice this, they practice this, they practice this. Why don't you? And then you argue with them a little. And then they give you reasons why that is the inner thing. That is the normal thing religious people do today. And you didn't remember to compare with the gospel of the New Testament. Then you are switched off. They have perverted the gospel of Christ. In your heart, in your life. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have were well preached unto you, let him be accursed. In verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Second Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 13. For such are false apostles, those deceivers, those preachers of false doctrine, those who have led the new covenant lane and they are now in the old covenant lane and then to religion, then to tradition. They are not in the gospel of grace and the gospel of Christ. And they have gone astray into thinking that religion alone suffices. And they have gone astray away from having the gospel making an impact in their lives. It says such a false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. In verse 14, I know Marvel, anybody can do that. 
For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. But 15, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, ministers of Satan, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. They look like the righteous. They look like they're preaching the gospel. They look like they're running the race, like we're running the race, whose end shall be according to their works. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the danger of a little leaven in our teaching. We might still continue talking about salvation plus circumcision sanctification plus tradition and we're talking about the power of the holy ghost with syncretic ideas and we're joining everything together that's very very dangerous when your heart your faith your commitment is not in christ only jesus only our savior our sanctifier, our baptizer in the Holy Ghost, our healer, the coming king. When you bring another idea, another tradition to that faith in Christ, the danger of a little leaven in our teaching. Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. A little leaven liveness the whole lamb if a little leaven liveness the whole lamb influences the whole lamb perverts the whole lamb destroys the whole lamb poisons the whole lamb if a little leaven does that how about a lot of Leaven, a lot of leaven. Circumcision comes in, observing the days, holy days of the Jews, observing that comes in, and the washing of the Levites, that one comes in, and the sacrifices of animals. That come that those things come in if a little leaven leaven the whole lump. How about a lot of leaven? Look at your personal life, your personal faith, your personal practice of the gospel of Christ. Is it simply on Christ, on the Bible, on the gospel? On the word of God Have you added another thing? They tell me there are preachers Preachers In our country Preachers In our continent Africa Preachers Outside Outside Africa Everywhere That they bring in Not only the power of the Holy Ghost They must visit somebody somewhere Who will give them another power behind the door they must go and wash somewhere they must dig something somewhere and put something inside they must depend on another power coming from somewhere so that the work they say they're doing for the lord will progress if a little leaven leave the whole lump how about a lot of Leaven. What do you get? All the things you do as you live the gospel, as you live your Christian life, as you live the way a believer ought to live. Are you bringing in a little leaven, a lot of leaven, and then all your Christian profession, everything? goes in vain look at first corinthians chapter 5 reading from verse 6 it says your glory is not good 
Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lamb? Look at verse 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven. Check up what you believe and examine, analyze if there is any circumcision there. Any tradition of the Jews there, any religious practice there, which is not based on the New Testament, on the gospel of Christ. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. As Christ was talking to his own disciples, he said, Beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Punch out hypocrisy, punch out insincerity. If you're practicing the gospel of love, and then the leaven of anger has come in. Punch out the leaven of anger. You are practicing the gospel of grace and the gospel of fellowship. Fellowship with the Lord and fellowship with one another and the leaven of animosity and hatred. All those things have come in a literal leaven of hypocrisy, of insincerity, of misbehavior, of misinterpretation of the word of God. A literal leaven of pride, a literal leaven of of depravity, the depravity of the human nature that spoils everything. Put it out. Put out, therefore, the old leaven that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, a Passover, is sacrificed for us. It tells us in Matthew chapter 16. Reading from verse 6, Then said Jesus unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then he tells us in verse 12, It says, Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine, the false doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. I pray the Lord will give us wisdom that will not allow any little fly, any little defilement, any little hypocrisy. Any little insincerity, any little religious tradition to spoil our Christian race in Jesus' name. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1, dead flies, in the original flies of death, cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So does a little folly, a little folly, a little foolishness, a little sinfulness, a little exaggeration, a little lie, a little deception, a little misinterpretation of the word. So does a little folly him that is a reputation for wisdom and honor. I pray that all the excuses, it's a little sin, it's a little lie, it's a little deception, all that will be cleansed out of our lives. Those things were not there when we were born again, genuinely born again. Those things were not there when we were sanctified, genuinely sanctified. Those things were not there when we started the race and we focused on our destination on heaven. Those things were not there. They shouldn't be there now. We're nearer the destination than we were. 
10 years ago. Let's come to point number two now. Point number two, the depraved, perverted teachers of lifeless legalism. Three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the punishment of false preachers of corruption. The preachers of corruption. And they come and they speak boldly. And they speak persuasively. And yet they excuse corruption. Corruption in doctrine. Corruption in deeds. Corruption in our dedication to the Lord. They excuse corruption. And the Lord has assured us there will be punishment for the false preachers of corruption. Number two, the persecution of fighting by fighting pretenders over circumcision. The fighting over circumcision. The thing is not even in our new covenant calling. And they're fighting for that. They're not fighting for the faith was delivered unto the saints. They must fight for the thing that has been abolished. For the circumcision abolished, they must fight for that. And because of that, they persecute the people, the preachers that stand on the gospel of Christ. The persecution by fighting pretenders over circumcision. Number three is the pain in the final place of the Christless. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the punishment of false preachers of corruption. Galatians chapter five, verse 10. It says, I have confidence in you. Galatians, I have confidence in you, church, through the Lord, that she will be known otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you with false doctrine, he that troubleth you with circumcision, he that troubleth you with the ideas and the traditions of the old abolished covenant shall bear his judgment whosoever he be whosoever brings a false doctrine whosoever brings the abolished rites and ceremonies of the old covenant whosoever brings that false doctrine to mix with the fresh, new Christ's doctrine of grace. It says, he will bear his judgment. Look at chapter 6 of Galatians, reading from verse 12. It tells us in verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they abandon the spirit. They want to make a, show, a, a fair show in the flesh. They constrain you to be circumcised. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. They don't want to be singled out by the Judaistic religious people that they are standing firm on the new covenant they want to be acceptable to the people inside and to the people outside one leg here one leg over there and they want to be acceptable and praised and appreciated by everyone so that they will not suffer persecution look at verse 13 in verse 13 for neither they themselves so are circumcised keep the law but they desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh matthew chapter 23 
reading from verse 15. In Matthew 23, verse 15, one to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now you understand, Christ didn't want those Pharisees and those scribes to deceive people. And so, instead of talking nicely to them and talking nicely about them, and people will misunderstand. They will think that Christ and the Pharisees, they are telling us the same thing. And what they tell us will lead us to the same heaven. And so, it was very clear and pungent. And he said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. One follower, one disciple, and when he is made, he make him to fold, charge of hell than yourselves. Verse 33. In verse 33, ye serpents, they were preachers. Ye serpents, they were deceivers. Ye serpents, they were hypocrites. Yes, serpents, they were the perpetrators of false doctrine. And he said, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? I pray you will not follow them. We will not follow them. Our converts will not follow them. Our members will not follow them. Your family will not follow them. We're well, looking at Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every good preacher produces good converts. Every good preacher produces good followers if you preach the word of god salvation by grace freedom from sin holiness without which no man shall say the lord that's good preaching the people who listen to you they'll bear good fruit because every good tree bringeth forth good fruit but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit and then in verse 18 a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit 19 every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire that's what Christ said that's what our Savior said that's what the Lord said and so we need to watch the fruit of our lives the fruit of our ministry the fruit of what we believe is each producing good fruit or are we producing evil fruit because those who do not bring forth good fruit will be caught down and cast into the fire. Verse 20, it says, Wherefore, by their fruits, good or bad, good, of e good or evil, lively or rotten, wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Number two here is... The persecution by fighting pretenders over circumcision. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then if the offense of the cross ceased. What does that mean? Paul the Apostle said, I'm preaching the cross of Christ. And the people are offended because they said, I should be preaching circumcision. 
I should be telling them to follow Moses. I shouldn't be exalting the Christ of Calvary. And I shouldn't be promoting the cross of Christ. They said, okay. And they say, after all, he's a Jew himself. And actually, he believes circumcision. That's what the deceivers were saying. And they were saying, actually, Paul, he only talks, you know, about the cross and all that when he gets there. When he gets to all the places, he's still preaching circumcision. It's all right. If I am preaching circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? If I'm no more preaching the cross of Christ, then the offense of the cross should have ceased. They shouldn't be after me anymore. They shouldn't be persecuting me anymore. Those pretenders were deceiving their hearers. And they were saying, Paul is also preaching what we are preaching. And yet he was suffering persecution. Look at chapter 4 verse 29. In chapter 4 verse 29, But as then he that was born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the spirit even so it is now what was he saying they are preaching the flesh circumcision of the flesh i am preaching the spirit and it's the conversion by the spirit and of the spirit and those who are preaching the circumcision of the flesh, they are the ones persecuting those who are preaching conversion in the spirit. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience. Look at verse 11. It says, and persecutions. Persecutions. He goes to this city. He preaches the cross of Christ. Salvation in Christ. Salvation by Christ. He preaches the fact that Christ suffered. Without the gauge that he might sanctify, purify us, and they who are sanctified, and he who sanctified were all of one, were in unity with him. Because of that, everywhere he went, persecution, affliction, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured but out of them all the Lord delivered me and it will deliver you I said it will deliver you in verse 12 yea and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution verse 13 but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived in verse 14 but continue thou you will continue i will continue the false preachers are multiplying everywhere and it's a discouragement in the heart of people and sometimes it makes you to wonder are we the only one that is right noah might have wondered the seven converted people with noah might have wondered millions of people in the world only age are we sure we're right are we sure that the majority all these people in their millions are we sure they're wrong Noah had no doubt. He was the preacher of righteousness, with the preacher of the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 
And of course, like today, many people might have ridiculed him, criticized him, judged him, and jeered at him. That didn't disturb him. If you know that the word of sanctification and holiness, if you know it is in the word of God from the beginning to the end and that God is a holy God and those who are going to get to heaven they will not compromise any iota of the holiness life if you know that beyond every shadow of doubt you will continue you will not say are we sure we are right the bible says we are right Jesus says we are right all the people that have gone, the heroes of faith, they say we're right. The angels of God, they say we're right. All earth and heaven and the people that believe the word of God, they say we're right. The people who do not believe in holiness, they are wrong. You will not follow the wrong crowd. It tells us very clearly then, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We're coming to number three here. Number three here is the pain in the final place of the Christless. The pain, the torture, the torment the agony, the punishment, the suffering in the final place of the Christless. Look at Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 12. I would they were even cut off that trouble you. The people that want to approach you from the platform and the solid established ground of holiness in Christ Paul the apostle said all those people that want to get you up into circumcision now circumcision doesn't require prayer you just take your body to the fellow that is going to do the cutting the surgery and that's all circumcision does not take consecration Circumcision does not take faith Circumcision does not take grace They want to move you away from the grace of God Away from faith in Christ Away from enduring Enduring everything you have to endure So that you will get to heaven It said they want to uproot you And get you out of the path that leads to heaven And get you to hell I would They would even They were even cut off that trouble you. Look at chapter 1 of Obadiah. Obadiah chapter 1. We're looking at verse 10. It says, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Cut off forever. Cut off from the Lord forever. In Romans chapter 11 verse 22. Romans 11 verse 22. Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God. On them. Those Judaizers on them. Those people with the propaganda of circumcision on them. Those false prophets that will want you to follow a way that doesn't need grace or faith or prayer or consecration. It says, on them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. On you, goodness, if you continue in the goodness of salvation. On you, goodness, if you continue on the goodness of sanctification. On you, if you continue in the goodness of the holiness of life. Holiness of heart. Holiness of devotion unto the Lord. It says, on thee, goodness, if thou continue 
in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. If you allow the deceivers, the religious propaganda, propagandists of today, if you allow them to sway you off, of the ground of salvation, of the ground of transformation of life, of the ground of holiness, without which no one shall see the Lord. And you follow the trending idea in religion, then you'll be cut off. I pray you'll not be cut off. But you know, we must stay where the word stays. We must stay where the grace of God stays. We must stay where the demand of God upon our lives stays. You will abide. I will abide. I pray every one of us will abide in the grace of God and the goodness of God, in the holiness of God in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three now. Point number three. We're looking at the delightful, purposeful transformation of a loving life, a life of love, love towards God, love towards His Word, love towards our neighbors, saving love, not compromising love, and love towards the brethren, the love that stands on what Christ demands, not lust, not fleshly attraction, not evil, not the love of immorality, the love that comes from the heart and makes us to live the life acceptable to God, the delightful, purposeful transformation into a loving life. Three things we're looking at. Number one, number one, fellowship in transformational liberty without filthiness. Number two, fulfillment of the law of law. That means the law of love among our fellows. Number three, freedom from the lust of the flesh. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at fellowship in transformational liberty without filthiness. It tells us in um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. That, that's not liberty to sin. It's not liberty to do evil. It's not liberty to leave the track of the old, of the new covenant, and then liberty to go to circumcision. No, don't misinterpret the Bible. Liberty, liberty, liberty. You have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an on occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. By love serve one another. It tells us in James chapter 1, reading from verse 25. James chapter 1, reading from verse 25, is telling us about the kind of liberty we have. The word that gives us the liberty. It says, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. That's the word of God that sets us free. Free from the flesh. Free from sin. Free from the old covenant. Free from the circumcision of the old covenant. And we read the perfect law of liberty and continuous therein. He be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. A doer of the work. A doer of the work. It says, This man shall be blessed in all his deeds. I pray you'll be blessed. Disobedience will not be blessed. Going up to the tradition of the Jews will not be blessed. 
and having confidence in the circumcision of the old covenant will not be blessed it's when we keep on our track and we keep on the watch of god and we're doers of the word in our personal lives in our families in the office in the marketplace everywhere we find ourselves we live according to what we have read what we have revealed unto us in the word of God that is when we have the blessing verse 26 it says if any man among you seem to be religious and bright let not his tongue but deceiveth his own heart this man's religion is vain verse 27 pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world that's the liberty the liberty that makes us have the grace of God the life of Christ to serve one another in love and to keep ourselves unstained, undefiled, unspotted by the world. Point number two here. Number two, the fulfillment of the love law or the law of love among our fellows. Galatians <coughs> chapter 5. Verse 14. <clears throat> God bless you. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. All the law is fulfilled in one word. What's the word? Not circumcision. What's the word? Not tradition. All the law is fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself they were circumcised those Pharisees they didn't love Christ they didn't love their neighbors that man that received the sight they drove him out of the synagogue and then even Nicodemus could not have the boldness to say this is the savior they said are you one of them are you a galilean go and check up has any prophet come out of galilee they didn't love their neighbors they were circumcised circumcision does not bring obedience to the law of god thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength that is the first commandment and the second is like unto it thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself and the, and the apostle says for all the law every sin is fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself and then he tells us in verse 15 it says but if ye bite and devour one another take heed that she be not consumed one of another Romans chapter 13 reading from verse 8 Romans chapter 13 we're looking at verse 8 oh no man anything but to love one another love one another you don't get involved with this circumcision tradition churchianity religiosity this is one thing to do when you are saved and your life is right and upright in christ it will have this mark to love one another for he that loveth another as 
fulfilled the law. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. It's saying if you love your neighbor, you will not commit adultery with her husband. You will not commit adultery with his wife. If you love your neighbor, you will not kill. If you love your neighbor, you will not steal his property. If you love your neighbor, you will not bear false witness against him. If you love your neighbor, you will not covet anything that belongs to him. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of of the Lord, you'll be thinking good about him. You'll appreciate him. You'll want to help him. You'll want to lift him up. You'll not want to take a good thing away from his son. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. It tells us in verse 10, it says in verse 10, love walketh no ill against to his neighbor. That neighbor may be an unbeliever, may be a sinner, may be a backslider, may be a believer, may be a member of the same church, a member of another church. Love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Why are you gossiping against that person is not a member of our church? Okay, if he's a member of your church, you'll not gossip against him. Yes, yes, but he's not a member of our church. Your neighbor, whether it belongs to your church or does not belong to your church, love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Why are you taking the property of that person is not a member of our church? And after all, he's so rich, you will not even know that he has missed anything. If I take that thing away, your neighbor is everyone that has connection with you, contact with you in any way. And if you're a real child of God and you are saved, you're born again, and the righteousness of Christ is in your life. Love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We're coming to number three here. Number three, freedom from the lust of the flesh freedom total freedom from the lust of the flesh in galatians chapter 5 reading from verse 16 galatians chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 16 this i say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh the spirit and the flesh do not come together. One is the narrow way, the other one is the broad way. And you cannot walk in the narrow way and the broad way at the same time. If you're saved, you're saved. You're walking in the spirit. The spirit is directing you, the scriptures are directing you the studies we're having they're changing your life and you are walking in the narrow path that leads to heaven if you are not born again but you are just professing to be born again word of mouth profession but you don't have the real experience of salvation you're walking in the broad way you don't have the grace and the strength to walk in the narrow path that leads to heaven and if you're going to get to heaven you must re-examine your life do i have the real thing am i just in religion you're circumcised like them you wear the dress like them and you do everything externally but the grace of god is what will help you to walk in the narrow path walking in the spirit and walking by the scriptures this i say then walk in the spirit in every choice you make in every character you demonstrate 
in every word of your mouth, in every interaction, in every plan, in every project, in everything you do, you single yourself out, I am born again. I am a child of God. The grace of God came into my heart and the life of Christ is imparted and imputed unto me. I walk the narrow path that leads to the kingdom. You walk in the spirit. You're totally taken away from the path of the flesh. That is the easy way that never resists any temptation that flows along with the world that eats what they are eating, drinking their alcohol and drinking all the evil things they drink and having all the hard drugs that they have. They're just like them. You come to church, you come to deeper life, you come to higher life, but you're just like them. Your thoughts, your mind, your habit, you're walking in the flesh. But when the grace of God comes into our lives and you know the date, you know the time, you know the place where that change came, you're so happy with the joy of salvation, with the experience of salvation. And you then, from that time, you walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen for every one of you. Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 1. In Romans chapter 8 verse 1, this, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Uncleanness is of, they walk not after the flesh. And all the suffering on the net, looking for pornographic things, gone. Because they walk not in the flesh. And all the association with, you know, evil people, fleshly people, and the people that uh, make merchandise of their body, and they trade with their body to have the pleasure of the flesh on their way to hell. You have nothing to do with that again. Uh, and there's no condemnation. There's no guilt. There is therefore now no condemnation to them uh, which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh and the strategy of the flesh and the mind of the flesh and the politics of the flesh and the things they do to cut down another person so that they can take his place you don't have anything to do with that anymore because now you are born again you're a child of god and it says there's no condemnation there's no guilt to them which are in christ jesus so walk not after the flesh but after the spirit then he tells us in verse 2 it says in verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free that's Paul the apostle it's a pity for the preacher who preach but they cannot testify they preach salvation they talk about salvation but that salvation the people near them will know this man knows how to talk but his life is different from his preaching there are people that they may talk about salvation about uh, you know a clean uh, life about a clear conscience and they talk about holiness without which no man shall say the lord but they themselves are not living the life that they are preaching about but paul the apostle said as for me for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death i pray that this powerful gospel will work in every one of our lives in jesus name look at uh, look at first john chapter one i'm reading from verse five first john chapter one we're reading from verse five this then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you that god 
is light and in him is no darkness at all then in verse 6 it says if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness if we say we have fellowship with him we're born again and we're followers of Christ we're disciples of Christ we're children of God if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth then in verse 7 it says if we walk but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin amen, amen. chapter 2 of first John I'm reading from verse 15 it says love not the world love the people love not the world love the sinners for their salvation to preach unto them don't do as they do love not the world love the pharisees to show them the error of their way but don't love them and love their circumcision love not the world love the people who are living the licentious life and the fleshly life but don't get any pleasure from them don't love their pleasure love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him if any man any woman any boy any girl any lady any young man if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him there are some people that tell us they say you know i don't really love smoking i'm born again but i want to win the smokers that's why i'm just putting this in my mouth well you are like them you are with them I don't really love the night clothes, but you know, I, I just want to go there and witness to them. You're deceiving yourself. You love the world at heart. You're just looking for excuses. I don't like this. I don't like, I don't love that. But I'm doing it so that I can win them. Uh -uh. It's like, you know, I don't like sinning, but I sin with them so I can save the sinner. How can you save the sinner if you're in the same peach with them if you're the same evil with them if you're in the same works of the flesh with them love not the world neither the things that are in the world if anyone any man love the world the love of the father is not in him look at verse 16 in verse 16 for all that is in the world the lost of the flesh in all their expressions and the lost of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but of the world and then in verse 17 and the world passeth away and the loss thereof but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever are there people that will do the will of God there today I said that there are people that will do the will of God there today. That whatever they say, what circumcision they bring in, what erroneous way they bring in, what false doctrine they bring in, and how many people are rushing, rushing there to the evil world that will make up your mind that by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, you will walk in the spirit, you will walk in the narrow path, and all those things of the world that will tie you down will not allow you to see the face of God in glory on the final day you brush all of them aside and courageously even if you have to walk alone you'll walk in this narrow path that leads to heaven in Jesus name and the holiness the Lord is expecting in every life, the life of every son, every daughter, the life of every child of God, and the life of every saint, that holiness we will find in your life. I said we'll find in your life. And when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we will 
life shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and when the saints go marching in where's my brother there where's my sister there you'll be there I will see you on the other side rise up and tell the Lord and say Lord I will not miss it I will not allow religion in the world I will not allow all the ideologies of the world I will not allow the religiosity of the world to hinder me from making it on that final day if you are not saved tell the Lord if you were saved and backslidden tell the Lord and come back and be restored if you are saved you need to be sanctified truly and fully Tell the Lord that your heart, your soul, your mind, everything within you will receive the sanctifying grace of God. If you are sanctified, you need to be stable and steady and you need to remain solid in the Lord. Tell the Lord that grace to abide and that grace to remain grant unto me and the Lord will help you. Make sure you have more grace today than you had yesterday before you go back home. Pray and the Lord will answer your prayer. Yeah.